welcome to Open Your Eyes, Start Your Morning Right. I'm Marlene Cuellar and thank you for joining us this morning. We understand that the biggest news right now is looking at the recent uh, prison escape. And so to be able to help us clarify where we are and what's going on, we have uh, the CEO of the Kobe Foundation on the line. Good morning, Marlene. How are you doing? I am uh, concerned, I should say, yes. but I could imagine your morning is a lot tougher. How are you? Uh, well, not too bad. Um, I, I, I don't think you, you could be more concerned than me, though. <laughs> that much I could tell you. Yes. Mr. Mario, we appreciate you having this conversation with us this morning because I know there's a lot of uh, misinformation and concerns that people have. Let's just start off uh, with your synopsis as to what happened last night. Well, what happened yesterday evening, um, we had a situation that was obviously a, a hostage-taking situation by a couple of prisoners um, uh, on the prison guards. Um, apparently, they were held at gunpoint, um, and they held them there from 1 o'clock in the afternoon, I understand, according to the reports that I received after, right up until about six o'clock when it was getting dark then they walked uh, they walked out of the prison yard and exited through the center at the back uh, with the prison officers as human shields so that is really the essence of what happened yesterday um, by what I have gathered so far it would appear that the one of the prison officers went to uh, put back in one of the guys that had just done feeding the other prisoners, mm -hmm. and it would appear that when he was trying to put him back in, uh, the guy overpowered him and took away his bunch of keys and okay. locked him up, uh, handcuffed him and locked him up in the in the cell. That is as far as I understand. And there's where everything went downhill after that. Mm -hmm. Now, how, how many hostages? Was it only one uh, prison officer? Well, it would have been it would have been three officers. Apparently, uh, when he locked up that first one, based on what I hear in the report, um, when he locked up that first one, he went and he stuck a knife to the other guy, and next, and then he somehow managed to walk up the spiral stairs of the tower and went and uh, relieved the prison guard who was in the watchtower of his uh, rifle. Mm -hmm. Then that is when he pretty much held them hostage all day and had them answering the radio as though everything was all right. Mr. Maria, one of the first questions people had was, um, and in fact we had a scheduled conversation to talk about COVID at first, um, mm -hmm. was that the prison was supposed to go into lockdown, so it would have been less movement. So how was it possible that this, this could have taken place? Well, you know, Marlene, um, we can we can set the systems in place. Uh, Creole have a saying that says, "When fire out or pay plane are the ashes." This is what typically happens in many organizations, especially big organizations who have huge numbers of employees, like the prison. Um, you know, this is typically what happens. You could set all your systems in place, all your controls, your recording system, your analyzing system. When your back is turned, you know things happen. Things happen. So. I would, I would, I have no difficulty believing that these guys never follow protocol. They took out prisoners, uh, like I said to Hippolyta last night. Uh, one of the things that concerns me is the is, is the guy that was uh, used as a as food man or a trustee, what they call it. Mm -hmm. um, if I had known that they had that guy working, I personally would not have sanctioned that. But I, it was totally, uh, I was totally unaware of that. The, um, situation until this whole thing unfolded. What, what do you mean by trustee? Well, it's normally um, people who you would uh, see, um, you would use to assist you with maybe feeding or getting water for the prisoners, mm -hmm. things like that, um, or any little um, uh, handyman type work uh, in and around the prison. Because that is typical of prisoners to use people who um, are trustees. It's a, it's a system that is done that is used worldwide mm -hmm. and um but their character you have to look at their character you have to look at their previous criminal history you have to look at their influence and conduct and all of these things 
Um, like I said, this particular situation, obviously the, the officer who runs this section obviously uses discretion to, to do it mm-hmm. without mentioning anything to, to, I guess, management, I would say. What section of the pr- prison um, did this take place? It happened, at the, it happened at the administrative segregation area. That is where prisoners are held for discipline for breaking prison, prison rules. So they were on punishment, this group of men who escaped? In essence, they were on punishment, yes, and they were serving some sanction for having broken prison rules. It's still, and in many cases, what I noticed is a lot of them were repeat offenders. Um, they kept coming to prison over and over, and obviously they had no intentions of changing, so you had to sanction them when they break the rules in the prison, and that is where you normally would send them. Um, I don't want anybody to think that the prison is, is unsafe or is not safe or not secure. The prison is secure. Whenever your people mess up, then they would give they, they, they can cause you major major problem because I, like I said last night to Hippolyta, prisoners have one thing on their hand: time, time, and they study all the prisoners I mean the prison officers, they study every movement you make. They know who is the soft prison officer, they know who is the tough prison officer, they know everything. So if people don't understand dy- dynamics in prison. That is one of the things I want them to understand today. So the weapons that you said were used, it was the, um, the gun from the officer uh, that they took hostage. And you also mentioned they, a knife. Mm-hmm. Well, and I understand it was a knife that they used initially mm-hmm. to, to, to get after the first prison officer. Um, they threatened him with a knife. And then what I understand, too, is that um, they held him at knife point while they relieve the other guy uh, of the weapon. At least that is what the reports are showing thus far. Where did they get the knife from? Was it an instrument that they made or something that was smuggled in? Well, it wasn't smuggled in. Uh, I understand it is a little pocket knife that, they, that one of the guards uh, kept on him. So it would, have, it would be his own knife, one of the guards' uh, knife. That's what I understand, a little pocket knife. It's nothing... Um, too big as far as I was told. Sounds like it has like a two-inch blade mm-hmm. or something to that effect. Now, there, there's been a, a lot of uh, rumors going around about who is in the uh, group of escaped prisoners. We know that the, the names and faces were released. Um, but mm-hmm. tell us a bit about the severity of the crimes that these persons have committed. Are you looking at people from Roman to people who are there serving life uh, sentences? What's, what's the severity of their crimes? Okay, what, what I can say right now at the top of my head, I know about 13 of them overall um, is in prison for murder. Um, I think out of that, there is 10 remanded, if I'm not mistaken, and three were convicted. Uh, one is doing a 25 years sentence. Um, so, uh, you know, and that is why I would say they're, they're considered dangerous, armed and dangerous. I wouldn't take chances with them. Um, there was there were another group that, like I said, were repeat offenders. Most of their crimes are, like I always refer to, crimes of dishonesty, uh, either robbery, burglary, or theft, those kinds of things. Uh, maybe a couple of drug trafficking in the midst. Uh, I think there was one person serving time for violating COVID-19 regulations and another person for illegal entry or immigration offense, I should say. Yeah, so they have varying degrees of uh, severity for their offenses. Right, right, right. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the sentence, like I said, aside from the guy doing 25 years, I think there was another guy doing um, 12 years and, and, and 10 years. However, the guy doing the 12 years, if my memory serves me well, uh, he has done majority of his sentence, so he might have probably a couple more years to serve. Um, actually, he had become eligible for parole, but w- w- was unsuccessful because of his conduct in prison. Mm-hmm. And like I said earlier, these are people who come to prison wanting to continue with their lifestyle that they have on the outside in terms of being criminal. And the prison does not tolerate that. So you, you mentioned earlier that these uh, persons, the people who initially took hostage over the prison um, guard, they were on administrative segregation, a, a punishment area. All right, 20 right. were being housed in one area? Yes, that is the that is the police station, if you would want to call it that. 
say who you could you could relate that to a, to the police station that we have in, in our societies uh, where you have to send them on sanction once they break the rule. You know that is where they go and serve out their sanction. All twenty in one cell. I just want to be clear. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. In different cells. In different cells. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Different cells. So when they got the keys, they were able to open up the entire area for the rest. Well, well, like I said earlier, they remember the guy relieved the prison officer after he locked him up in the cell mm -hmm. and handcuffed him. He released him as the key for the for the prison for the cells, and he started unlocking other prisoners to to go. How are your guards doing? Did anyone get injured? Uh, one of them sustained a, he sustained a burst um, to his, I think it was his right side of his head, if I remember well what I saw last night. Mm -hmm. And the others, they were a bit, um, I would say, uh, they, they, they sustained some injuries, but nothing life-threatening. Um, none of them any at all suffered any life-threatening mm -hmm. uh, injuries. And how many weapons did the inmates leave with? Only one. Only one. It is the guy in the tower. Okay. Uh-huh. So, Mr. Maria, when people heard this news last night, clearly you know that uh, everyone started to panic. They're worried. Um, the commissioner said consider these men to be armed and dangerous. Um, wh what is the status at this point? Has anyone be been recaptured over the course of the night? Well... Uh, up until just now when I checked my phone before you called me, I didn't get any text or any information that anybody had been recaptured. But I know there is an all-out manhunt for these guys, and um, we will be relentless in, in bringing them back. Um, certainly, like I said, there were three Guatemalans in the midst. Um, uh, aside from that, all the rest are Belizeans, and I don't know where they think they're going to go. They, they, you know, they have to come back, um, no doubt. Any at all. Uh, so the three Guatemalans, like I said, one was remanded for murder, and the other two, I think, was one was for um, that illegal entry, and I think another one for theft or something to that effect. So what happens internally now? I mean, a lot of people are very critical, of course, uh, of the of the Kobe Foundation for um, not having enough checks and protocols for this to even take place. Well. I, like I tell you, Marlene, I, I'm, I'm not going to get into any um, argument to the public on how they feel. I understand how they feel. I understand safety comes first, and I, I'm one of those persons who always say that prisons are all about uh, protecting society, and I will speak to that. Um, however, um, I think we did all we did all we could have. I mean, we we conduct training for our staff all the time. We try to teach them tips and, and those kinds of things, and. I cannot be at the prison uh, 24 hours around the clock. I have to go home, and um, this happens to be one of those days, uh, one of those situations where I was at home, and I got the call, and I had to respond. Um, so I came to the prison. I left my home, and I came to the prison to check what, what happened. What we're doing right now is we're putting all the information together so we could get a very clear picture mm. of what really transpired. Um, I mean, looking at things right now, I, I, I sense that there was complacency. I sense that somebody uh, definitely weren't alert. I sense all of that. But I want to prove those things by asking the hard questions, mm -hmm. because there are some very hard questions that I will be asking from my hierarchy, and I will expect them to give me reports. I even went, uh, even, like I said, the commissioner was very nice to send personnel for me along with the Brigadier, Brigadier General, sent uh, personnel to help me comb the area. Um, but we also got CIB to come in and take statements because at the end of the day, you know, we will be finding out, you know, what really happened, how it happened. We, are, we will see if it was, if it was complacency uh, or, or those kinds of things. Um, you know, because I sense it, but I don't want to jump to conclusions. So let me just be fair yeah. and, and find out everything, and then I could put a comprehensive report together. But um, I don't want anybody to get the idea that the prison isn't safe. It is very secure, and it is very safe. These guys that went, I mean, think about it. There was 90-something uh, people got there. And if everybody had wanted to go, obviously everybody would have gone because the guy had the whole bunch of keys to let out everybody. But obviously the ones that went were the ones that choose to 
to be defiant and disrespectful and those kinds of things. So obviously they have no change to change as far as things is looking for them. Will you also be looking into the situation as to whether or not there was collusion from the inside? Because don't you have hourly checks that would have had to take place or people who would have been monitoring the status of these inmates? Well, we won't rule that out. We won't rule that out. But right about now, I don't get the sense that that would probably be the situation. I, I, I get, I, I, personally, I think complacency um, makes up for a lot of it. Um, I don't want to say, I don't want to say that it was sincere ignorance because one of the guards is, is a seven-year veteran. So it's not like he just joined the prison last year, you know, or last week, mm -hmm. you know. So he has that experience and he knows the kind of pe people we deal with on a daily basis. This is what society doesn't really get to see. And a lot of people don't really get to see. A lot of people think that these guys are in prison for singing too loudly in church. That is not the case. They make a lot of halabaloo. When you try to discipline them, they think you're torturing them, they think you're treating them in, in, inhumanely and, and cruelly and those kinds of things. And pe people don't understand what you're putting up with. Um, Hippolyto, I think they, I, they, they alluded to some threats where they said that they will kill me. I mean, I get those threats all the time. I just, I just don't let those things, um, you know, scare me and those kinds of things because at the end of the day, I've been in this business for the last 18 years. And, and, and I know they threaten every so often when they are frustrated. And thank God so far nothing has happened, and I don't think anything will happen. Those things are just what they are, threats. So at this point this morning, based on what you know, you feel that there was slippage on the part of the system itself, uh, not being watchful enough or not anticipating um, the, the conniving um, nature of the people who are being held there. That, uh, there was definitely slippage and poor judgment in my mind. Mm -hmm. Because like I tell you, uh, even the guard, the guard that runs the location, I am saying to you, you know, in certain terms, that if I knew he had that guy out, those two guys out, the, the, the mastermind, uh, which is the guy Montejo and, and the other guy Oseguera, believe you me, I, that would not have passed me because I know these people, you know, very well, and I would never have approved that kind of thing. But like I said, you know, I, 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 I can I didn't know and I didn't care about it, so it would have been hard for me to pick up. Do they have the autonomy to be able to, to let, you call them trustees, these are guys that you give added responsibility to, from what I understand. Did, they, did the prison guard have the authority to have them out to be helping? Uh, in that fashion, no. I actually... They should have. They should have actually called me to get my to get my blessing on those kind of hire. Um, but for some reason or the other, it, it would appear that they chose to to do it um, and and don't tell anybody about it. So that is what that is what have me real. Uh, I would say disappointed, uh, disgusted. I, I don't know what word to use. I'm trying not to be too personal here. Um, so. That is my situation. I, I I just have to be very careful how I go about it. I, I want to, like I said, I want to get all the information, take yeah. pictures and all of these things. And if we see that there was something criminal that happened, then we, we deal with it uh, criminally by getting the police involved. But my initial assessment, though, is that it looks like it was poor judgment and complacency. And, of course, not being alert, not being vigilant. No. If, if you look at the time itself, you said these that the guards were being held hostage from one in the afternoon till about dark, which was about six. Um, mm -hmm. You have security cameras, uh, you have uh, checks and, and guards moving around. How is it possible that no one detected what was going on? Okay, I don't have security cameras in those areas. Um, I, I have tried to lobby for cameras for the entire prison, but you know, from, from various, um, you know, places, but I haven't been, they haven't been um, helpful in giving me any. So I don't have cameras in every place. Um, I have in strategic points, um, that especially the point of entry, because we're always concerned about people trying to uh, invade the prison to take out these high-profile prisoners, uh, like these guys that are landing across it 
tons of cocaine and uh, those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. So we have them pretty much in strategic um, entry areas. Um, so we can see them trying to come in and, and deflect them if we have to. Mm-hmm. Um, as it relates to the patrol, yes, there were all of those in place. And um, I I don't know. They, obviously, they didn't do any patrol. So all of that, we're getting all the journals together, and we're trying to see when was the last patrol. We have something, but like I said, we're looking at everything, and then we will hand over what we think we need to hand over to the police once we see that something criminal went on. Um, like I said earlier, you know, when when we are not around, things happen, and this is one of those situations. Yeah. Obviously, we, you know, the management was not around, and these guys just took the liberty to do uh, the, the staff I'm talking about, the guards, took the liberty to get complacent and relaxed and, and in alert, whatever you call it, mm-hmm. uh, not, and not follow the procedures, which, is, which include uh, not patrolling as they ought to have been patrolling. Because I'm saying that even if they had those guys, first of all, I, I have issue with the gun being taken away. I don't know how that guy could have gotten access to that gun because it's kind of difficult to get to that guy upstairs. I mean, in, so tower. in the tower. The gun was taken from yeah. the guard in the tower. Yeah, that, yeah that, that, that is kind of difficult. I, I still cannot reconcile that one any at all, you know? And, um, and, and so I'm looking at all of that. And then secondly, I'm saying that even if they had even if they had um, held them hostage, I believe that um, I believe that they should have became aware of it. Let's say at least an hour after, because the, the patrols uh, are not necessarily done every hour. But I'm saying that an hour was, was more than ample time to have figured that something was wrong. Um, obviously, the guys had the three guards locked up in the cell, and the gun was pointed at them. And whenever the the, the, the leaders called in to check and see how their location is, or get a report, uh, a status report. Obviously, they forced them to say everything was okay. And they went by that. They did not go, obviously, to verify and see that everything was okay. So we, we have some glitches on the part of the personnel who were to, who were to enforce and, and carry out those procedures and protocols, those security procedures and protocols. Obviously, we have a problem there. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I still have lots of questions. I mean, isn't there a door at the tower? Why would an inmate be able to simply walk up there? Um, mm-hmm. these, are, these are things that seem extremely negligent. Yeah, yes, exactly. And, and I, understand, I understand because it's the same way I feel, you know. But certainly, you know, we, we, we don't have the ideal prison like, like in America where you have everything is controlled by a button. All doors open at once and all doors doors closed at once, those kinds of things. And, and, we, and we have been making do with what we have all along. And I know the prison is secure. It's just the personnel that lets you down all the time. And I'm sorry, I, I, I won't bury my head in the sun and, and, and behave as though <laughs> I don't recognize these things. Um, like I said, people can criticize, you know, but they, they, they don't know what we go through as, as, prison, as prison workers. Um, we go through a and whole lots of things put up with a lot of, you know, abuses from prisoners. It's no joke. Mm-hmm. And, and just one more point I wanted to clarify. I know we promised you a, a, a quick chit-chat, but uh, in, in leaving the compound, what's the distance that these group of 20 men had to move? Um, and why wasn't that an opportunity then to be able to stop them from exiting the compound? Well, to be honest, it is about at least 300 feet. And like I tell you, that is why I insist on saying that somebody, these guys obviously in the other towers obviously were in alert. I have major issues with it. I am saying that even when the guard in the tower, the, 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 in the tower that um, who was who the gun was taken from, went missing, somebody if they were paying attention would have seen, they would have seen that um, there's not a guard there, you know, peeping out. Or because you can see the way the towers are structured, you should be able to see the guard from any angle once you're in, in another tower. But obviously nobody sounded any alarm. Mm-hmm. And as so they made their that exit is, that is out why the I, gate? That is why I insist on saying that their level of vigilance was extremely low. And as they made their exit out the gate, there no one, I mean, is that the point when they detected what was happening? Well, remember I said they waited until dark set in. Mm-hmm. And that is when they started to make their, their way out. And by that time, it was 
like I said, it was 28 of them. So, uh, and then they had the three guards, I understand, at one point. So it meant that if maybe any shooting started from the other tower guard, maybe they would have shot the, the, the guard in front of them. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how that one played out. Um, you know, I have spoken to the guys, but they were probably shaken up. I, I think they themselves were confused. Mr. Mario, I have to say from what you are saying so far, I can imagine um, that you have a lot to uh, comb through in terms of the actions of uh, the staff that you have there. And while we'll always acknowledge um, those who work hard, it does seem that there was quite a bit of, you call it complacency, I'd say negligence in, in being able to do uh, what was necessary. Yeah, it's a combination of both, no doubt about it. It's a combination of both, yep. Now, if people watch this this morning, if they think that this is the status quo at the prison, um, I mean, that you don't check to see if the guard is there, that no one notices that for six, five, six hours, um, that they're under the control of inmates, uh, they may think that this yeah. is everyday function at the prison. Well, like I tell you, Marlene, I, you know, people can criticize. I don't even know that a statue was ever erected in honor of a critic, and that is why I'm not too <laughs> bothered about them. We have our procedures. We have our protocols. We know exactly what to do, but I don't know how I can, uh, how, how, how people can just jump to conclusion. I mean, all the good that the prison has done over the years, uh, one bad, and I know this is a major one in this particular case, and they would interpret that to mean that that is the status quo and all of these things. Um, they, are, they are entitled to their opinion. It's just that they need to be objective mm -hmm. and, and be fair. But like I said, I am not too bothered about that because at the end of the day, I am certain they cannot offer us an alternative to coming and manage the prison the way we have done it over, over the years. And in terms of the investigation moving forward, is that going to be done solely by uh, yourself and your team or are you going to have others come in and join? Well, uh, like I said, I, I have the police, the IB, they're investigating um, not only the hostage-taking, but they're also going to investigate whether, you know, guards colluded because we, we don't want to rule that out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, we want to look at that hard. I mean, there's been a lot of rumors flying since this incident happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to be able to, to uh, I mean, sift out the rumors from facts. Because at the end of the day, I'm not, not going to go... You know, that's one of the things I like that I don't have Facebook because I, I could not be bothered what is being placed on Facebook if there's anything but being placed on Facebook. At the end of the day, I will push on with, with what, we, what our mission is and what our vision is. And um, I, I, cannot be, I cannot lose focus. You know, we have to stay yes. focused. Um, those guys who opted to leave the prison under that kind of situation, obviously they have no change. change and, um, yeah, like the good old Stephen Covey says, you... you you create a character, you're going to reap a destiny. So uh, I guess that's the part some of them are, are, are heading. Well, you know, it, it's less than 24 hours, and I know you have a lot more investigation to do. Will you also be reporting to the public as to what your findings are? Then, uh, I could do that. I have no problem with that. Um, you know, and, and certainly as we capture these guys, we, as we begin to capture them, I will keep you abreast of you know, how they are coming back in. Because, like I tell you, they are all Belizeans, and I don't know, you know, if I were a Belizean, I don't know why I would want to escape from prison, knowing that I have nowhere to go. Um, like I said, they're, all of their pictures have been plastered all over social media, and, and we have sent them off to our counterparts in the bordering countries, mm -hmm. including America. So it's going to be a hard task for them to go anywhere unnoticed. And, of course, it's also a crime for people to harbor um, or to, to shield um, any of these prisoners in their homes? Well, I, I, hope, I hope the Belizeans are wise enough to know that um, that could earn them a prison sentence mm -hmm. of two years if, if, if they are harboring these guys. So I would encourage family members that if these guys show up, do the right thing, call the police discreetly and have the police pick them up because it's not going to serve them any good purpose. They can find themselves in prison for two years. Oh, well, Mr. Murray, you have a lot on your hands right now, and I appreciate you uh, having this conversation with us this morning so we can uh, paint a clearer picture to Belizeans who are waking up this morning. Again, we're all concerned, but of course, you have uh, far bigger issues on your hand. So best of luck yeah. and stay safe. Yes, ma'am. Thank you.
All right. We appreciate it. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. And so there you have it. That's an uh, outline of the situation from the CEO of the Kobe Foundation himself, Rogelio Murillo. And from what we were able to ascertain from that conversation, there's a lot more clarity. Um, it was a hostage uh, situation. Uh, a prison guard was, in fact, um, taken into um, custody by a group of, by the inmates who were not in their cell at that time. They were in uh, administrative segregation. That's what they called it. It was um, an area that is designated for people who are being punished. Uh, a holding area of sorts. Um, this guard was handcuffed and locked within the cell. Um, he did have the assistance of two inmates who did manage to escape, um, who are called trustees. From what Mr. Marie explained, if you're just joining us, um, these trustees are prisoners who are given additional responsibility um, to assist along the way. The guard did not have uh, the approval to have the trustees working with him at that time. Um, and that seems to be an area that Mr. Maria has pointed out is one that he has to look into. He should have been called and asked if they can. This is one of the, the trustees, Carlos Montejo, who we heard Mr. Maria say was uh, one of the masterminds behind this prison break. Um, after the first guard was taken hostage, two subsequent guards, including one in the tower, um, were then taken into hostage as well. The weapon was taken from the guard in the tower. And they held these three guards hostage for five hours, uh, a little bit over five hours, it seems, until it became dark, and then used the prison guards as their shield to make their exit out of the compound. Um, you know, we're going to have to wait for all the details of the final details of this investigation. Uh, I think one thing that we uh, can gather from what uh, the CEO has spoken of is that he seems to really feel that there was failure on the part of the staff there to be able to follow through on the checks that were necessary. Um, now, what that means, whether or not they were in cahoots with the plan, whether or not they were just not doing the checks they should have done at the time, um, those are all things that will have to be asked within the next, uh, as, as the investigation unfolds, and definitely um, questions that we all deserve answers to. But what we can say at this point is that uh, none of the men have been captured so far. Uh, there is one weapon that was taken from the compound from a guard and a pocket knife. And so uh, the commissioner in his release yesterday did warn Belizeans that they are, these uh, escapees are considered armed and dangerous. Um, you know, you want to take into consideration that if you're traveling on the roads or if you're moving around right now, there may be delays, there'll be checkpoints, there'll be um, additional searches taking place. Of course, if you are a family member, please remember that uh, you, can, you, are, you can be charged. Um, if you are harboring one of these inmates in your home, um, please just do the responsible thing and report them. Um, and you can call the police or you can call the tip line and let them know what's going on. So that is uh, the status update as of 7 a.m. this morning. This is 12 hours in, so this information may very well change by 6 p.m. tonight or become clearer by 6 p.m. tonight in our newscast where you are sure to hear the latest on what is going on. And so we uh, want to thank CEO for, for joining in on that conversation.